Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Blessed and holy is the name of God. He's the creator of the universe. He's our Father. He sent Jesus, His Son, to redeem us, to save us. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. Welcome to worship 
of this deity, this God today. Thank you all for coming, for getting up early this morning. Daylight savings time is upon us. It's the day of the year that we appointed. We're going to adjust the calendars or the, the clock so we can take uh, advantage of the daylight. It is on our calendar March the 14th of the year 2021. I have been seeing some people reminisce over the past year. You know, nearly a year ago, we all started to exist in our culture a little bit differently as the year went. It also lines up on another calendar. I would say it's God's calendar. Today is the first day of the first month of the Jewish religious calendar. This would be nice and one today. The nation of Israel, I think right now, also has a civil calendar that their new year would begin later in the year, in the seventh month, sometime around September of our year. We, they would say that the year is 5,781 right now. I take that to be from creation. There are various different ways of keeping track of all this time. Like I said, we're making an adjustment today and we have leap years and so on to make things work. But God's calendar, he, he on that calendar appointed several times or as it's translated feasts. So this will set in motion the seven feasts or appointed times that God established back in the Old Testament. So on the 14th day of Nisan, or coming up in about 14 days, there's Passover, the Feast of the Passover. On the 15th day, there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts. On the 16th day, the Feast of First Fruits, And then we count seven weeks in one day for the Feast of Weeks, or as we know it, Pentecost. These four feasts of the seven that God appointed a long time ago seem to be prophetic of the first coming of Jesus. He came, he was our Passover lamb. He lived a sinless life. There was no leaven in him. He rose from the grave or was the first fruits of the resurrection. And then 50 days later, after he had ascended back up to heaven, the Holy Spirit came down to dwell in his believers. There are three more feasts that happen in the fall of the year that God appointed as times. Peers like they are prophetic of his second coming. They're the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. You could study into those, and it's a worthy study, as to what the second coming of Jesus will be like. When will it be? Will this be the year? This 5,781 Will this be it? Lots of opinions out there on that one. Um, as I reviewed this past year, I remembered a specific piece of wisdom that was given to me about September of last year. I want to pass on to you. Um, when I consider all those feasts and the possibility that at the time of the Feast of Trumpets, it could be this year that Jesus comes again and, and fulfills the last three feasts that have yet to been fulfilled. This, this piece of wisdom, uh, was, it was about September, so it was right after Hayes was born. And um, my grandma and grandpa invited us over for supper because mom's taking care of the baby and we're all stretched out a little thin. And grandma wanted to give us supper. And during that time, if you'll remember with me, with me back to September, the obviously... The coronavirus had really taken hold of our culture and the way we acted. Um, throughout the entire summer, we were coming down the end of summer, there had been rioting in a lot of the big cities. And then, around the middle of September, the government of the United States had helped broker a peace deal called the Abraham Accords between Israel and a couple other Muslim nations that have been the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Right around that time, I, I started to wonder, and I think we had even heard a fair amount of preaching on end time prophecy, and I had been in discussions with some of you over, is this the end time? Is this when Jesus will come? Will it be this year? That would have been 
5,780. And I didn't think that it was quite there yet, but it was interesting to hear opinions. And I was going to my grandpa, who's in his 80s, his upper 80s, and I was desirous to hear his opinion of all of these things because that, that peace treaty is like, wow, this really brings the end time prophecy into it. So we sat down to eat, and as the conversation goes, we talked about the virus and the effect it was having on all of our lives, and they had had, had to skip a funeral of one of their good friends, and who had it, who hadn't, how it was affecting their health, um, the riots, and, and the, then this new peace deal, and I said, Grandpa, we, we have the scriptures, and we are familiar with the end-time prophecies. What, what, what are we to make of all this? He said, well, you mean as, as far as is this the end? And I said, yeah, yeah. What are we to make of all this? He said, well, and if you know my grandpa, that's, that's the key. Here, here comes the, the, the good stuff. It, it can be the, the wisdom. It could also be right before the punchline in a good story. But he said, well, we need to be ready. We aren't promised tonight. You or I, and he's, he's in his upper 80s. You or I are not promised tonight. We need to be ready. And then he went on to talk about some of those prophecies and how that all laid out. But it is beautifully simple to, to work through all the fog of what we are still dealing with today and how our world has changed is to be ready. How can we be ready? The Bible is voluminous in all of the instruction on how we can be ready. I just picked one out. Let's turn to Romans 13. And I want to start reading in verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything. This is under the guise of being ready. Should it be today that Jesus comes for you? It may not be his second coming, but he may call you to him. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife or envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. God has appointed a time as he appointed feasts. We don't know exactly what time it is. It could be this year that Jesus will come again and establish his reign here on the earth, it could be today that he requires you. Let's be ready. Bill, will you have prayer? Thank you. 
317, just the first and last verse, 317. <coughs> Good morning. Welcome. Are you ready? I was, in a sense, my question for you is, I was planning to begin, are you walking with Jesus? The road that you are on right now in your life, where does it lead? Do you know where it leads? Some of you here this morning have never made a decision to follow Christ. And some of you here this morning have been following Christ, but maybe at a distance. The Bible tells us about someone who tried that. You remember Peter? The night that Jesus was betrayed. And the word tells us that he followed him at a distance all the way to the courtyard of the high priest. And you know what happened next? He ended up denying him, denying that he even knew him. It didn't work out well for Peter to follow at a distance, and it won't work out well for any of us here today. To try to follow at a distance. There may be many reasons why a person would, would follow Jesus at a distance. I think it boils down to unbelief in every case. But, but oftentimes, perhaps you want to see how things work, are going to work out. You're just not sure that you actually want to commit, but you keep your eye on it. But, but the truth of the matter is, just like Kidron said... There's not going to be time to make that decision when that decision really needs to be made. Because your life could end this afternoon on the way home. Your heart could stop beating tomorrow. And Jesus could return at any time. Are you ready for that? <clears throat> this morning I want to encourage all of us to get close to Jesus and to stay close to Jesus, to walk close to Jesus. And that takes moving from where we are at. And that means that our life is going to look different. Jesus called people 18 times in the scriptures. He said, follow me. Follow me. And for some, that meant leaving their friends before their funeral. For some, that mean not, meant not saying goodbye to their family. For some, that meant getting up and leaving their job in the middle of it. But for all of us, it takes moving from where we're at. 
You won't follow Jesus by continuing to sit under the tree where he finds you, by continuing to do what you've always done. I think about that woman who was caught in adultery in John 8. What an obvious situation. It says they caught her in the very act and they brought her before Jesus. <clears throat> and she deserved... <clears throat> according to the law, to be punished. They wanted to stone her. <clears throat> Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, responded, I believe by inviting her to follow him. In not so many words, he said, after everyone else had left, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And yet, it's impossible to, to do that without following Christ. <clears throat> without the power of Jesus in our lives, we cannot go and sin no more. And he's inviting all of us this morning to do that very thing. I don't know, perhaps the Holy Spirit speaks to you this morning. And maybe you're caught in the act of your sin as it speaks to your heart. And you know that you've failed. You know that you've messed up. And maybe you even feel like that if everybody knew what a mess you were, that they'd want to stone you like they wanted to stone that woman. But wherever Jesus finds you this morning, He's inviting you to follow Him. It doesn't matter how bad your situation is. He's calling you to follow Him, to move out, to go and sin no more. And he wants, He's calling you to that and He wants to help you with that. It's been said many times that Jesus takes you right where you are, but He doesn't leave you there. He calls you higher. And when you've experienced Jesus, when you've tasted Jesus, you don't want to stay where you were. I read a story one time about a little boy who fell out of bed in the middle of the night. And when his mom asked him what had happened, he said, I guess I stayed too close to the place where I got in. You know, if we're to fall away from Jesus, that's going to be the reason. When we stay too close to the place that we get in, let's continue to follow closer and closer to Jesus if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew 7. We're going to read a couple verses. But I don't know who needs to hear this this morning. All of you, you young people, I just want to encourage you to jump in with both feet. I want to, I want to see you be radical. I want to see you be passionate. I want to see you be sold out for Jesus. To be different. I think as parents, many times, perhaps we've failed at encouraging our children to be different. Because as parents, we want our children to belong. We want our children to fit in. We want them to, to not be different in many ways. And, and that's kind of a normal emotion of, of a parent. No child wants to be different. And yet, as a Christ follower, you're going to be different in this world that we live in. You're going to be different. And we've got to, to have the faith to be able to be okay with being different. To know that it's what Christ has called us to. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. This morning you know these verses well, no doubt. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. When I read those verses, I always go back to a time four or five years ago. We went to New Mexico to visit my brother. And he lives about 30 to 40 minutes from the, the Mexico border. And I needed some dental work done. And my brother had been to Mexico for it. And many people in the community had, had went down there. And so I, we lined it up. And it's a pretty slick system. You, you drive down there in El Paso. You park at a pretty nice hotel. And they send a, a van over to pick you up. And they take you down across the border into Juarez, Mexico. And it's just right across the border. And you go in there, and it's, it's a fraction of the cost of, of what we pay here in the United States for dental work. And so we went down there. They picked us up. We went in. We got our dental work done. And, and they'll bring you back. And it's, it's all part of it. It's free. It's just to get you to come. They, they, they'll pick you up and take you back. But we, we decided we would walk back across to our vehicle. 
And so we did. We walked down the streets, and we got us some lunch, and stopped at a couple shops, and we got across the got to the bridge there, and it's the Rio River there that that runs and divides uh, Mexico from New Mexico there. And so we're on this bridge, and we get to suddenly about halfway across, it's just filled with people, and all of these people are headed into America. They're waiting in line. And you look at the other side, and there was, there was no line going into Mexico. There was really nobody going over there. Just, you know, you see somebody go, and a little bit later. But, and I know it's not a perfect analogy, but it made me think of this verse. And, I, and when I read these verses, I just think about that. Uh, all of these people, we were, we were with a lot of people that wanted to go into a, a land where... For the American dream, you know, you can d- fulfill the desires of the, the, the uh, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, perhaps you could say. And nobody wanted to go to Mexico. If you were going that way, you were walking alone, at least on the bridge we were on. And I just had to think about that as this, it speaks of this wide gate and this broad way, and there are many on that way. And you can begin to feel like you can begin to get comfortable. It's what everyone else is doing. It must be all right, or it must be right to head this way. But as we talked a few weeks back, the majority is not always right, as we learn there in Numbers 13. And when it comes to this way of salvation, the, the way of Christ, the majority is not going to be right. Narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way. Jesus Christ is the gate. Jesus Christ is the way, and it's the only way. This morning, you're not choosing the easy path when you choose to make Jesus your Lord. You're going to be going against the grain, against the flow. You're going the opposite way. You're going to choose a road that at times is lonely. Your companions may be few. Many won't understand why. And there's going to be times when even other believers will be unable to walk the road that you are walking. It feels that you walk it alone, but the truth is that God is always near. Do you ever feel different or lonely as you walk through life. I remember feeling that way often, you know, when I was younger. And I would, I think maybe for therapy, as I got my license, I would go out and I would just drive. Now, it wasn't that I didn't have friends, but sometimes you just felt, felt lonely. I'd drive for miles and I'd maybe listen to music. I'd, I'd talk to God. I'd think. Sometimes it seemed like God didn't even listen. I imagine you've been there before. It wasn't that people didn't care for you. But there's just those times in life where you just need to be alone. Where maybe it feels like others don't understand. But if you get there often, I want you to know this truth that you're not alone, you know, you, and, and you're not even alone in feeling. That's a common feeling. Um, think about Elijah and, and all of the powerful ways that God worked through him. And we're actually going to look at that here in a little bit in, in 1 Kings. But he got to a point, he went out and sat under a tree and he said, God, take my life. He didn't want to live. I think about Joseph and how different he must have felt as he was sold into a strange land, he was a slave, and how lonely that must have been. And then he ended up in prison. And no doubt that was lonely. And Noah, you know, he built an ark in the middle of the desert for years. He felt different. And it just, there's example after example, and we know, we've heard those stories. Jesus, he was, it says, forsaken at the end of his life. He knew what it felt to be lonely. It's okay to be different. It's okay to be lonely. 
David, he knew what it was like to be lonely and different as he fled from Saul for years and he hid in caves. And in Psalms 40, I'm going to read you the first four verses of Psalms 40 while David was going through a hard time and the way seemed difficult. And he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And that's something that I want you to remember. It takes patience. It takes waiting on the Lord. Isaiah speaks of that. But I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me, and He heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Waiting patiently on the Lord is not easy. I don't know why he takes so long sometimes. I do know that he says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I have to rest and trust that his ways are best. And when you look back on life, you realize every time, that his ways were best. But in the moment and in the difficult times, in those times when we need to see something happen now because we can't see where we're going or we can't get through this narrow path that's ahead of us, it's hard to be patient. But God says, David here says, that he waited patiently on the Lord. And over and over in the Word, it speaks of being patient. And the Lord is very patient, it says. He's patient with us. Sometimes it takes a lot longer than we would like to see it take. Continue to wait on the Lord. He's going to hear. He's going to hear. And He's going to pull you up. Every difficult place that you face, He will either um, pull you up out of the pit like He did for David, or He's going to make your way through. I think about that um, picture, or it's, a, it's a saying, and I, I thought about looking it up, but there, there's something to do with a father and a son uh, walking in the sand on the beach, and there's two sets of footprints, and then for a little ways, there's only one set of footprints, and, and the boy says, why'd you leave me, Dad? And he said, well, that was when I was carrying you. And sometimes the way gets so narrow, this path, this straight path, this straight gate narrow path. It gets so narrow, if you've been in the, in the Rockies or in the mountain range somewhere, you, perhaps you saw a, a path that goes up a mountain, and then you get to a place that you would not want to go. It is so narrow, and if one misstep, and you're going to fall to your death. But our, our walk in life, it, it takes us, God takes us in those kind of places. And those are the times that we've got to let Him carry us. There's only can be one set of footprints on that path. And He wants to carry us. And we would do well to let Him carry us the entire way. But there's no doubt there's these times when we can't do it on our own. We can't make it through this path without falling. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says that when you're in the hardest of times, when you feel alone and unable, He says, fear not, I am with you. You're never alone as a believer. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He will give you the strength to make it through those difficult times, to be able to communicate through those difficult relationships and conversations that have to have, to be able to trust through the doctor visits, that are hard, through the days where you feel all alone, through the times when people seem to talk unkind to you or behind your back. Sometimes the best way to know that we're in the will of God is when the path gets the narrowest. I have a book at home that tells a story of a time not long ago in a persecuted nation where a group of believers were gathered together 
to, for a secret Bible study, and hostile police officers burst in and took over the meeting. They rounded up all the Christians, and one by one they pointed a gun to each person's head, threatening to kill them unless they spit on the Bible. With heavy hearts, each member of the group took turns spitting on the cover of the Bible in order to preserve their lives. But one 16-year-old girl, with tears streaming down her face, knelt down and tenderly wiped the spittle from the Bible with the corner of her dress. A few seconds later, she was dead. Today, God is looking for courageous Christians who will be willing to wipe the spit from the Bible, so to speak. And perhaps that's not the exact opportunity that you will have, but you're going to have opportunity in the world that we live in to stand up for Jesus when those around you won't. And it might cost you. And it might be hard. But will you do it? When no one else will, will you do it, even if it costs you everything? As you consider whether or not you will enter the straight gate and walk this narrow way, I want to take you to a, another mountain. The first uh, set of verses we read there in Matthew it was Jesus speaking on a mountain. And here in 1 Kings chapter 18, it's Elijah on Mount Carmel. And I just really like this chapter, and we're not, for the sake of time, we won't go through the whole thing, but we are going to read through several of the verses here in this chapter this morning. Ahab is king over Israel, and he's a wicked king. His wife is Jezebel, and she's a wicked woman. And they have not followed in God's ways. And God sends a lack of rain upon the land, and for three years it doesn't rain. Verse, 18, verse 1 of chapter 18, It came to pass after many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, so this, it's been three years it hasn't rained, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So we're going to skip these next few verses. It's, a, it's an interesting account, but we're going to go on down to verse 17 now. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said unto him, Aren't you the one that's troubling Israel? And what you learn in those other verses is that he's got everybody looking for Elijah. Like he's, he is very upset with Elijah. He, think, he thinks Elijah has caused this, this drought. And he wants, him, he wants him. He wants him killed. But he says, aren't you the one that troubles Israel? And, and Elijah answers, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed Balaam. And I, I, when I read these verses, I think about you children uh, with your parents sometimes. You know, you've got a set of, you've got rules in your house, right? And what happens if you disobey the rules? There's consequences, right? And so maybe you do something that you're not supposed to do, and you have to do a chore that you don't like to do, or you have to sit and time out, or, or maybe you get grounded. And sometimes in those times, you can get kind of upset at your parents. You can be like, well, you made me stand in the corner, or well, you made me stay home and miss the party, and, and we blame it on our parents. When the truth of the matter is, we were the ones that didn't do what we were supposed to do, and we brought it on ourselves. And that's what, that's what Ahab's doing. He's kind of like a child here, and he's blaming this on Elijah, the drought. When it was his actions, he knew what he, how he should have lived, and he didn't do it. And he brought this upon himself, and that's, that's what this is saying here. Elijah says, it's not me. This is on you, king. You've been following Balaam. Okay, so now he tells in verse 19, he says, Now wherefore, send and gather to me all Israel. So he calls all of Israel to come to mount this mountain. It's got to be a lot of people, because we're going to learn that there's 950 prophets that show up. So there's 1,000 people there, to, plus all, the, all of Israel that comes. A lot of people are here. So he says, uh, all, the, all the prophets of Baal, 450. The prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. And Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel. Ahab responded. He listened to him. He sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together to Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto the people 
This is the main verse we wanted, but, but I, I want to get this whole story here as we think about this. How long, he said this, he said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And it says the people answered Him not a word. Like, does that get a little awkward? He, he's, he gives them this decision to make, and, and nobody answers Him. They're unwilling or they're unable to respond they continued to sit on the fence. Maybe that's what you're doing this morning. You hear, but you don't want to make a choice. And we see this, I believe, too often in our lives. I, I see it in my life. I see it in our churches I see it across our country as we sit and we listen to the Word of God proclaimed. We hear the calls to action and the call to follow Him, and yet we sit and we fail to respond. We fail to move out. We fail to truly get up and follow Him. We answer not a word. Maybe we're interested in God, not totally writing it off, maybe even following at a distance but still interested in ourselves and in the pleasures of the day. We're afraid of making a choice or a commitment, and so we don't choose. Which ultimately can be the worst thing that you can do. Jesus says in Revelations, I, I were that you were cold or hot, but since, since you are neither cold or hot, you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Be better that you be cold or hot, to say yes or no, than to sit on the fence So, how long will you continue to sit in silence? How long will you continue to put off the decision to follow Christ? To follow near to Christ? Maybe you say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I just haven't decided to follow Him yet. I'll get serious someday. What will it take? I want to continue on in this chapter. I don't know if this will help you. This helped the people here on Mount Carmel. Verse 22, Elijah said to the people, I'm the only one that's here as a prophet of the Lord. Baal's prophets are 450 men. So he has this idea. He says, let's... Let them give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people said, hey, that's a good idea. We want to see this. So Elijah told the prophets of Baal, you choose first. And dress it for you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but don't put any fire under it. They took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. I don't know whether it started at 9, 10 o'clock, so two, three hours here, they're calling on Baal. Saying, Oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar that was made. There's 450 men here crying out to Baal for hours. They're jumping on the altar. That's not all. It came to pass at noon that Elijah made fun of them. And he said, cry louder. I mean, it had to be kind of a circus to watch. Cry louder for he's a God. Maybe he's talking or pursuing or he's on a journey or maybe he's sleeping and he needs woke up. And so they cried louder. And cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. So they're cutting themselves. They're jumping on the altar. 450 men crying out to Baal. This this happened till noon. It says it came to pass when midday was past. So they're in the middle of the afternoon. They prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. They did this all day long. And there was neither voice nor any to answer, 
nor any that regard it. Nothing happened. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones. In verse 32, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and he cut the bullocks in pieces. And he laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. And he said, do it again. And he said, do it again. Three times they filled four barrels, 12 barrels of water. They dump on this, this altar and it runs around into, the, fills the trench, it says in verse 35. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. And that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And that is just my prayer this morning. That God would hear, that God would turn your hearts back to him. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones, it burnt up stones, and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. What a fire. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And I don't know how this can look in your life, how this can apply in your life, but you know that there are things that you have been doing, there are ways that you have been trying to live, and they're not working. And it's kind of like you're calling out to Baal, you're trying on your own, and it, it's like you've done it day after day, and nothing's changing in your life, and nothing's different. Can you see yourself of your own effort and of your own work, kind of like these prophets of Baal? And Elijah comes... And he calls on the true God. And he asks God to show himself and make himself real in this moment. And he does it. And in that instant, he did it immediately. And you might call out to God this week. And you might say, I'm going to stop trying on my own. I'm going to stop seeking all of my own desires and my own ways. And I'm going to cry out to God. And, and maybe he's not going to show up that quickly or that miraculously. Sometimes it takes waiting patiently and continuing to call on him. Don't give up. But I promise you that if you will seek God with your whole heart and give your life to Him, that He's going to respond in a way just as powerful as He's responded here to all those people on that mountain. And when He does, you will find yourself on your face. The Lord is God. And you will be ready to follow Him and to follow close to Him. It's time to get off the fence. I think of King Agrippa when I think of following at a distance. And Paul shared with King Agrippa. And he said, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. Almost doesn't get you there. Almost is not enough. Indecision is the worst decision. Years ago, if you wanted a pair of shoes, you couldn't go down to Payless Shoes or Shoe Carnival. You couldn't even go to Sears or J.C. Penney and pick up a pair of ready-made shoes to wear. There was a time, if you wanted shoes or boots, you had to go to someone called a shoe cobbler. When Ronald Reagan was a young man, an aunt had taken him to the cobbler to have a pair of shoes made for him. The shoemaker asked the young Reagan, do you want a square toe or a round toe? Reagan hemmed and hauled. So the cobbler said, come back in a day or two and let me know what you decide. A few days later, the shoemaker saw Reagan on the street and asked him what he decided about the shoes. I still have not made up my mind, the boy said. Very well, said the cobbler. 
When Reagan received the shoes, he was shocked to see that one shoe had a square toe and the other had a round toe. Years later, Reagan commented, Looking at those shoes every day taught me a lesson. If you do not make your own decisions, someone else will make them for you. And I might say it like this, that not making a decision is making a decision. And when you don't choose good, you choose evil. When you don't choose right, you choose wrong. When you don't choose life, you choose death. And maybe you say, well, that doesn't make sense. I disagree. You see, our nature is evil. We're a fallen people. Ever since the fall in the garden, ever since the curse, we're fallen. And our tendencies are wrong. And so by choosing nothing, by not choosing, we're choosing our default. And the human default is death. There's a way out. But we have to choose it. We get to choose life. God is not forcing us. God is not controlling us as though we were a robot. He gives, He says He gives before us this day life and death. And He tells us what to choose. Therefore, choose life so that you can live. What gate will you enter? What road will you travel with your life? Never choose default. If you want to know more about the salvation story, about the gospel, there's many people who would talk to you, would explain it, share with you. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. Salvation is only by grace through faith in Christ. And you'll not be saved any other way. But this journey with Christ is going to take you the opposite way in life. But if you're ready to follow Jesus up close, if you're ready to get off the fence, to confess Him as Lord, if you're ready to do and not just hear, if you're ready to wipe the spit off of the Bible, then I invite you to give your heart to Jesus this morning. To give your life to Jesus. To confess Him. To be baptized. To jump in to serving Christ. Whether that's in Africa or in Covington or in whatever town you live in or wherever God calls you to be. To get involved in your local body. To get involved in kingdom work. To stop sitting on the fence, but to follow Jesus up close. Be sure you know where the road you're on is leading you. Let's have a song. Let's sing from the Christian Henry. I invite you to stand with me if you can and sing number 861. 861 in the Christian Henry. If you don't have one,
Mr. Hurd. Dear gracious and kind and heavenly Father, we come to you once more again this morning and early afternoon with a thankful heart and just a heart that goes out to those who have not yet made a decision. Lord, we know that you've given us opportunity, you've given us your word today to help us to focus on the thought that if we don't make a decision to follow you, then our decision is to take that path that leads to hell. So Lord, just ask that you would prick our hearts that have made that decision and those that haven't made the decision, that they would choose to follow you. Those of us who have chose to follow you, help us to be an example and reach out to those around us who are lost and who are struggling to make that decision whether they want life abundant or to live by the flesh. Lord, we just pray with those that are willing to stand courageous for your word, even with the words in front of them, that if you choose to express your faith in Christ, that you'll, you'll die. Just help us all to have that courage and that strength to be radical, to stand for your word. We live in a world where the strength, the courageous Christian is, at least in our nation, somewhat of a more of a rare entity than what it would be in other nations where persecution is more freely and openly done on those who have faith in you. Just help us to have that radical drive in our hearts to pursue you, to seek you. Lord, we just pray for our congregation here and that we could be a congregation of church that is clearly seeking you and caring and loving for those around us. We just pray that you'd be with us throughout the afternoon that all of our hearts would be open, that your word would sink in, that we could move forward with you, looking for opportunities and hearing the opportunities, the opportunities that you would bring before us to <coughs> share your word with either a neighbor or a relative that may have not chose to follow you, or even a fellow believer who is just down and needs encouragement. We just thank you for your willingness to come and die for our sins on the cross, to accept us as we are in our wretched state, but as we heard, but you wouldn't choose to leave us there. You are waiting and willing to bring us from our broken state to a new state of life with you in eternity. We thank you for your sacrifice for us. We ask for our family to be in heaven. Thank you all for being here. Um, as far as announcements go, we do have a children's service coming up in April. Uh, it's about a month out. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone who's volunteered to, to do that, but maybe someone should consider praying about that and what the Lord might have you share that evening. Be glad to have a volunteer. Um, is there any announcement about resurrection morning at this point that needs to be made? Any other? Yes. Uh, I just have a reminder that I sent an email out yesterday and people haven't looked at it yet for the need for Resurrection Sunday morning. Okay. Haiti auction is this next weekend. Are there any announcements that need to be made at this time other than that? All right. Phil? Fred Pfeiffer's health is very poor, and he's headed to Phoenix, Arizona, to a hospital, or to okay for treatment. So continue to pray for that family. 
In regards to the Haiti auction, I think I saw an email that there's still a need for volunteers to help serve. I don't know if there's any other announcements that need to be made regarding that this week. So consider how you can serve. If there's nothing else. Stay, uh, yeah, that? On, on that, let, let Connor know if you are going to help. He just has a couple more slots to fill there. And then any donations, the best thing would be to have it midday Friday or before on Friday uh, or see somebody on the board to get those donations. Showing up Friday night is a little hard to create everything. In fact, please don't, but if you do, we'll take it. Um, so that's what they get in. Uh, maybe it'll be announced, but there's, I think, a truth project this afternoon here and then Wednesday night. I, I think it's full. Does anyone want to give any more details on that? Go ahead. Brother Jerry Garber's birthday this week. Uh, send him a card if you have a chance. It's good to see Ivan and Bonnie here. It's been a long time. So welcome back. Was there another hand I saw back here? What time is the Truth Project this afternoon? Four o'clock. All right, so if you want to watch the Truth Project this afternoon, it'll be at 4 o'clock, and then again at 7 on Wednesday evening. You're welcome. Yes. And, yeah, there's food afterwards. And there's food this evening afterwards. You're invited to bring some food to share, right? All right. Okay, well, thank you for being here. Blessings on your day, on your week, on your walk. Uh, we can have a, a line of a verse, and you may be dismissed.